Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in your name, Lord Jesus. As we gather in our, our respective home, Lord God, to listen to your word and to praise and to worship you. Lord Father, I pray, Lord God, let each and every one, Lord God, to rise up and to praise you and to worship you, Lord, with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our mind, Lord God, be in spirit and in truth, Lord God, to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the
keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you.
Shalom and good morning, church. Welcome to the Oasis SIB English Online Service. I'd like to especially also welcome our friends, our visitors who are joining this service for the very first time. We hope that you'll be blessed in this service and we hope that you will continue to join us every time that we have this online service. So before I proceed any further, uh, since you know, we have some visitors online, I'd like to just pray a short prayer blessing over you. Why not you just bow your heads and close your eyes and I just want to pray. God's favor, God's peace and blessings to be upon you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this morning that we can come together to worship you and to listen to your word. I want to thank you for our online visitors who are joining this English online service. We pray that you will bless them, minister to them in a very special way, O God. Lord, we thank you that they can be part of us even this morning. And Lord, I pray whatever needs that they may have, O God, Lord, you are able to meet them at their point of need. So we surrender this time to you. And we also thank you for our friends, 
uh, church members who are here to join this service. We pray, Father, prepare our hearts, O oh God, that this morning we will have a wonderful time together, O oh God. So be with us. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'd like to first of all congratulate those of you who have completed the hand copying of the uh, book of Acts. You know, today is actually the closing date for this challenge number one of 2020. I'm so proud of you because so many of you have completed, you know, the youngest to the oldest and I'm so thankful because when I see many of you copying, you know, I think I, the way I see your handwriting, you know, and I know you really put in a lot of effort. So, well done, well done. I hope that this is not just an exercise of copying the scriptures, but you have benefited from it. You have learned much, you know, understanding the book of Acts much better. And also you can experience the book of Acts coming alive in your own life. You know, that to know the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, you can experience signs and wonders, miracles and healings. So, I encourage you to... No, keep doing that even though this is your uh, challenge you have completed you can still copy the other books in the Bible and if you have not submitted your books please submit to the church office as soon as possible we are now in the midst of getting ready a custom made special mystery gift for all those who have completed uh, this challenge and meanwhile there's also challenge number two memory verse challenge we are already in the month of June I hope that you have been memorizing each month one verse and so by the end of this year, you will memorize at least 10 to 12 verses. So do memorize these verses and I want to encourage you to take heed of the memory verse for each month. And uh, all this that we are doing is to help you to have a deeper uh, knowledge of the Word of God and also that you will grow in Him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can you still remember the church theme for 2020? That is, embrace our God-given vision together. Yeah, embrace our God-given vision. So I want to encourage you, you know, friends, Let's all participate in all these activities. Okay, uh, today I'd like to share on this topic, faithful or forgetful. You know, many of us are upset when politicians break their promises, especially after being elected to office. You know, I think this is happening in every country. In today's society, marriages are also dissolved because of broken promises or infidelities. Talk about the business world. In the business world, a breach of promise or contract has also become a fairly common phenomenon. So before we are too quick to point fingers at others, let's also evaluate ourselves, whether we too are prone to break promises, especially our promises unto God. Today we are going to wrap up the sermon series on the book of Nehemiah, which we have commenced since the beginning of the year. By now, Nehemiah's project, the repair and rebuilding of the walls and the gates of Jerusalem, was complete. It was time for the dedication. And this is a wonderful, joyous dedication service. In chapter 12, verses 27 to 47, the dedication of the city was characterized by joy, praise, singing, you know, it was so wonderful. The women and the children came up. They were expressing joy. And the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. All this is recorded in chapter 12. And everything was in place for the proper functioning of the temple in Jerusalem. Think about it. If the book ended here, it would be a very wonderful, glorious ending. You know, it would have concluded on a glorious, wonderful note. It's as though they live happily ever after. But sadly, Nehemiah still had to deal with some serious problems among the people. Nehemiah didn't end on that wonderful, glorious note. In chapter 13, which is, which is the chapter we are going to look at today, the Jews sinned in the very things they promised they would uphold. How short spiritual memory is. We promise and then we quickly forget. Okay, let me test your memory now. Can you recall the three parts of the covenant which I talked about three Sundays ago? You remember in Nehemiah chapter 10, the Jews, the Israelites actually made a covenant. There were three parts of the covenant. Can you remember that? Three S. What are the three F's? What are the three issues that they promised God to deal with? Okay, the first F would be family. That's right, family, which talks about marriages. Second F, faith, Sabbath, 
It's about Sabbath lifestyle. And the third F, that's right, finances, which is about tithes and offerings. For those of you who remember, well done. But when you look at what has happened in Nehemiah chapter 13, the Jews made these promises in relation to these three parts of the covenant, but so soon, when we come to chapter 13, they have broken all these three promises. How grieved God must have been. The three areas they promised God were the very three areas which they fell very easily and quickly. So my sermon today, as I mentioned, is entitled, Faithful or Forgetful? Turn to your neighbor right now, your family members especially, ask them, are you faithful or forgetful? Are you faithful or forgetful? As people, as people of God, we need to be faithful. We must not drift from our promises and abandon the commitments we have made earlier. And today we want to learn from the mistakes done by the Israelites in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 4 to 31. Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 4 to 31. But right now let's turn to chapter 13, verses 6 to 7. Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 6 to 7. I'm going to read from the NIV, so please follow along with me, verses 6 to 7. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. In Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 6 to 7, it is noted that Nehemiah had to return to Babylon in 433 BC. That is actually 12 years after he had arrived in Jerusalem. Now he had to go back to Babylon. He left the governing of the city in the hands of his brother. We are not sure whether he was recalled by King Artaxerxes or he was fulfilling an agreement to return. It is also not known exactly how long he remained in Babylon. But when he returned to Jerusalem, it was not a pleasant sight. There were already lingering problems. He discovered that the people had fallen back into their old ways. And Nehemiah must have realized that it was one thing to rebuild the walls, but it was another thing entirely to reform the community. Let's now consider the problems which had to do with the three promises in the covenant that the people had recently made. And in order to see the violation of these three parts of the covenant, which I mentioned, three F's, I would like you to go through with me in Nehemiah chapter 13, but we're going to go in a reverse portion, uh, uh, sequence. In other words, we're going to go from the back of chapter 13, from behind, from the back portion, all the way to the front. Okay, so it is a reverse order. The reason I'm doing this is so that you can see how the Jews, how the Israelites violated the three F's, family, faith and finances. So the first problem has to do with family and it is about intermarriages. In chapter 13 verses 23 to 31. Chapter 13 verses 23 to 31. So please follow along with me. I'm going to read from verses 23 to 31. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like this that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many na nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Verse 27. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? Verse 28. One of the sons of Joelda, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to son Balad, the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. 
So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything for rain and assigned them duties each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, my God. Problem number one has to do with family intermarriages. We begin with this violation of the first part of the covenant. There is the same old problem of intermarrying with pagan neighbors, with all the danger of apostasy and idolatry. The Jews actually made a firm covenant promising to discontinue the practice of intermarriage, but they failed again. They did not comply, they did not fulfill their promise. In chapter 13, verse 23, as we have read, In those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. All these were their pagan neighbors. Ammon and Moab were neighboring countries east of the Jordan, whose beginnings were by, the, by Lot's incestuous relationships with his two daughters. You can read more about that in Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 to 38. Look now at chapter 13, verse 24. You know, another serious outcome of such intermarriages had to do with their children. What was the problem? Half of them spoke foreign languages of their mothers and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. What are the implications of this? Hebrew was being lost as the mother tongue in Judah and this would have serious repercussions. These children would not be able to read Hebrew scriptures. Now, would they be able to participate in the Hebrew liturgies of worship? And that this was actually the prescription for the loss of faith among the next generation. Church, do you realize that this is also happening today in our society, in our world as well? Not only have there been marriages between people of two different religions, but there is neg negligence in teaching the next generation gospel truths as well as the language of God. As a result, our youths are embracing the languages of the ungodly world. This is also Satan's strategy to corrupt the minds, the words and actions of the next generation. Three weeks ago, I addressed the young people and married couples. So today, let me address the parents who are here. If you are a parent, please listen up. If you are a Christian parent, it is vital that you pass on the baton of faith to the next generation. It is vital that you pass on your baton of faith to the next generation. If you are aware, you know, I'm a pastor who is really passionate about the young generation. I started off my full-time ministry as a youth pastor and over these years, you know, already uh, 18 years in the full-time ministry, I still have this passion for the young people. I believe in the next generation. Therefore, I spend a lot of time discipling, mentoring the younger generation. And I want to encourage and urge you, all of you, whether you are parents or grandparents, believe in the next generation, impart to the next generation, pass on the burden of faith to the next generation. But what can we do? What can we do to pass on the burden of faith? How can you pass on the burden of faith to this next generation? The keys are found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, and chapter 6, verses 20 to 25. Because of time, I won't be reading the scriptures, but I'm going to just very quickly summarize the three points on how to pass on the burden of faith to the next generation. First key is found in chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. Love God wholeheartedly. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and mind. As parents, you need to love God first and foremost yourselves. We are not to be hypocritical or inconsistent in our behavior. Young people are very sensitive. They can detect any inconsistency in us very easily. Thus, our love for God must be translated into our lifestyle. Love God wholeheartedly. Second key is impress truth practically in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 7 to 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 says, Talk about the commandments when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. This reference to sit, walk along, lie down, and get up refer to the routines, routines of daily life. And as parents, it is your responsibility, it is our responsibility to impress truths about God by showing 
how this divine truth relates to daily concrete living. In other words, they must see us not just talking about the word, but also doing the word. And we must be able to impress these truths practically into their lives. And I think this is something very important. Whether when we are at work, when we are in church or at home or in a recreation, we'll be able to utilize and seize every opportunity to impress these truths about the Word of God practically into the next generation. The third key, share faith stories personally. Share faith stories personally. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 20 to 25. All of us as Christians, especially if you have been Christians for some years, I'm sure you have many powerful testimonies, faith stories about how you have experienced God, how God has been so real to you. He has delivered you, protected you, provided for you, healed you. All these are filled faith stories, real life stories that you have experienced God for yourselves. And our young generations, they do not want to only hear about our belief, but they want to hear of our experiences of God, how God has been so real in our lives. And today, you know, our young people, they are very experiential people. They want to experience for themselves. Therefore, share your faith stories, your testimonies, so that they can understand your struggles. At the same time, they can see the expressions of your faith. They want to know how God has been real in your life. There's no point just talking about God, but they want to see you experiencing God. And so we need to do that. And then we can pass on the burden of faith to the next generation. So very quickly, what are the three points, what are the three keys? Love God wholeheartedly, impress truths practically, and share faith stories personally. In Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 25 onwards, we see that Nehemiah had to rebuild the guilty parties. He considered the practice of intermarriage terrible wickedness and being unfaithful to our God. These are very strong words. This problem had even infected the highest places. One of the grandsons of the high priest Eliashib had married the daughter of Sambala. Can you still remember Sambala? Yeah, he was one of Nehemiah's old arch enemy. Nehemiah was so upset that he drove him away in verse 28. And Nehemiah then had the priests and the Levites purified from all foreign influences. Church, the question I'm going to ask you again is, are you faithful? or forgetful. Whether you are a parent, a spouse, or a young person, I urge you to take heed of God's word and the covenant, the promises you have made before God. For parents, once again, don't lose the next generation to the world. And today, as a pastor, it is very sad when I notice, when I hear about the second generation Christian, the third generation Christian who have backslidden, who have drifted away, who are lost to the world. And so parents, grandparents, do you play a very vital role. Don't lose the next generation to the world. We need to set an example for them and we need to pray for them. We need to do our part to pass on the burden of faith to them. Teach them the language of God's people. Teach them the word of God and be faithful yourself. Be faithful yourself. Be faithful and not forgetful. Moving on to problem number two. The second F, remember that it's faith and it talks about a Sabbath lifestyle. Here in chapter 13 verses 15 to 22, you can see that the Jews actually violated the Sabbath commandment. It's about Sabbath violations. So turn with me now to verses 15 to 22, chapter 13 verses 15 to 22. Please follow along with me as I read to you. In verse 15, it says, In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing it in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. Verse 16, People from Tyre who live in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. Verse 17, I rebuilt the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same thing so that our God 
brought all this calamity on us and on this city. Now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. Verse 19, when evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not open until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. If you still remember, the second part of the covenant has to do with their family, has to do with their faith, in faith living in respect to keeping the Sabbath. Nevertheless, upon his second visit to the city, Nehemiah found out that the people had blatantly disregarded the weekly Sabbath. Work was already going on. Work was being done and a roaring trade was going on in the city on the Lord's appointed day of rest on the Sabbath day. Do you know that the temptation to violate the Sabbath rest was especially characteristic of the non-Jewish merchants? And yet the Jews also fell into this very quickly. It also appears that the gates were being left wide open for traders who were entering to sell produce from nearby farms and from as far as away as Tyre, where fish caught in the Mediterranean Sea were brought in. So what it means was that at that time, you know, because the gates were wide open, people who from outside the city, they brought in the produce of the farms, they brought in the fish to sell in the city. And they were doing all this on Sabbath day. Therefore, Nehemiah rebuked the officials saying, What is this wicked thing you are doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day. Again, very strong words. Why? Because the Sabbath was being violated and broken and the nobles did not seem to care. They had shirked their duties. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we are all aware, we are now in this phase of RMCO, uh, Recovery Movement Control Order. But as the restrictions are easing off, you know, you notice whether in our own country or elsewhere in the other parts of the world, members of the public are beginning to take these restrictions lightly. They are taking fewer precautions and they are also flouting the rules, therefore violating these restrictions or RMCO. Just a few days ago, the star highlighted some common violations during the M RMCO. I hope you are not doing that, yeah? Okay, you know, some people are even arrested for such violations. But why would people violate the order? Very likely after being locked down for so long, you know, maybe locked down for almost three months now, I'm sure, you know, you just feel like you want to go out. Many wish to be out and enjoy freedom. Nothing wrong, isn't it? Of course, you know, we all want to breathe some fresh air outside. We want to just be out for a while. But we still need to be careful. You know, we must not forget that the dangers are still lurking outside. COVID-19 is not over. But why am I bringing this point out? See, look at this. There is a similar pattern here compared to what is happening in Nehemiah's times. The Jews violated the Sabbath because they forgot the calamity that had befallen the nation and the city in the past. They forgot. People are also very quick to forget, you know, they just a few months ago, you know, when COVID-19 was so serious, you know, the death rate was increasing by the day. People were alarmed, people were fearful and panicky. But as the COVID-19 cases are declining, people are taking these restrictions lightly. Now they are flouting the rules. Let's not be forgetful. But for Nehemiah, this was a deadly serious matter. Nehemiah had to take the necessary measures to ensure that the Sabbath would be respected and kept holy. He ordered the gates of Jerusalem to be shut tight throughout the Sabbath. If you look at verse 19, and let's read verses 20 to 21 again very quickly. 
verses 20 to 21 says, Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spend the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Just now I talked about even in our country, you know, people were arrested for violating the RMCO or MCO. Now, when I look at this verse and I was reading, meditating upon this, I was thinking, hey, perhaps, perhaps in this, this was the EMCO in those days of Nehemiah, Enhanced Movement Control Order. Why? Because they shut the gates tight so that no one can come into the city. You know, today we also know of this, you know, borders are closed. And then at one point in time, interstate travel was prevented. You know, they put on all these uh, barricades and all that to prevent people from traveling in, across states. Perhaps this was the EMCO of those days. And I was just thinking to myself, do we need such an enforced Sabbath before we actually obey and keep the Sabbath holy? Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you faithful or forgetful in observing the Sabbath lifestyle? The dangers post MCO is that we return to a busy, hectic lifestyle that we forget to keep the Sabbath. Sometimes I really wonder, you know, do we need to be locked down again so that we have to learn the hard way? You know, God wants us to be still and know that He's God. God wants us to observe the Sabbath, you know, to learn to rest in His presence, to learn to draw close to Him. Do we need an enforced Sabbath before we observe it? But I believe God is not such a God that He wants to enforce things on us. He has given us a free will. But now it is up to us. Do we want to be faithful? Or do we want to still be forgetful? So turn to your family members again. If you have someone in your house, if not, ask yourself, am I faithful or forgetful? Ask yourself, Family member, are you faithful or forgetful? I pray that all of us will be faithful. Let me just move on to the final problem, problem number three, finances. And it has to do with tithes and offerings, the neglecting of tithes and offerings. And now we're going to read from verses 4 to 14, the front part of Nehemiah chapter 13. And I know that you have been sitting you know, in your sofa, in your living room or bedroom for some time. Now why don't all of you stand up to your feet, okay? Stand up to your feet, stretch a little bit, okay? Right now, I want you to just read along with me, verses 4 to 14. Are you all ready? At the count of three, one, two, three. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the types of grain, new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers as well as the contributions for the priests were six. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Elashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God, the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. Verse 11, so I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the types of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shalemiah, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan son of Zaku, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Verse 14. Remember me for this, my God, and do not block out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and His services. Amen. Please be seated. Problem number three. The third part of the covenant, 
you know, which focused on financial giving, which included tithes and special offerings. In verses 4 to 14, there was a very serious problem the storerooms that were meant to keep materials for the worship of God, as well as the tithes that were brought by the people for the priests, the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers. Nehemiah discovered that Eliashib the high priest, who was in charge of the storerooms, had acted very irresponsibly and treacherously. He was allied the Jews' enemy, Tobiah. Remember Tobiah? Yes, that infamous man, Tobiah. Eliashib had let him use this room in the temple. Tobiah being a layman and a foreigner had no right to be in the temple. For him to occupy a room in the house of God, the courts of the house of God, was almost like blasphemous. Tobiah was an enemy of God's people who had tried very hard to stop the rebuilding of the wall. Remember, Tobiah had mocked the, mocked the people of God. He had mocked Nehemiah. He had therefore insulted God. How could he be allowed to stay in God's holy temple? By letting him stay there, Eliashib the high priest had done an evil thing. It is a very sad thing when the servants of God compromise with the enemies of God. Friends, church, do you still remember that one of the disciples of Jesus, he also made a deal with the enemies of the Lord? Who was that? That's right, Judas Iscariot. Tragically, gullible or unfaithful Christians and leaders become the means by which the enemies of God enter the sanctuary. By sanctuary here, what I mean is, it can be our hearts, it can be our church or families. If we are not careful, we will be like Judas Iscariot, we will be like Eliashib, we allow these enemies of God to enter our homes, our church, our hearts. And the devil, the world and the flesh can be happily lodged in these places because permission was granted by unfaithful Christians. What should be our response when we see this happening? In Nehemiah's case, he lost no time in throwing out all of Tobiah's goods and including Tobiah himself. He threw Tobiah out. He had the temple chamber sanctified for its proper use. Drastic action are very necessary. One possible reason why Eliashib had allowed Tobiah to occupy the large room the storeroom was that the people had neglected to bring their tithes and offerings into the temple. That's why the room was largely empty. Why? Because this was actually an evidence that the people had not kept their promise made in the covenant. In chapter 13 verse 10, Nehemiah learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them. And all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. What does that mean? Due to the disobedience of the people, those who were assigned to serve in the temple had to toil in the field to support themselves. Because nobody gave tithes and offerings, so they had no money and they had to go back to the fields to work to support themselves. And this would have adversely affected the worship of God in the temple. Nehemiah rebuilt the officials for neglecting their duties. In Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 to 9, the prophet Malachi also had something to say about this. The word of God clearly tells us that withholding tithes and offerings to him is tantamount to robbing God. And those who do so are under a curse. Has this principle changed today? This is still the word of God. Tithes and offerings are still part of the commandments of God. And we too, as Christians, we need to give back unto him because he deserves our first fruits. He deserves the best from us. What did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah changed the leadership to ensure that the flow of tithes into the temple was restored. Church, once again let me ask this, do we take God's commandments lightly or for granted? Let, let's not persist in stubborn sinfulness, lest we incur God's curse and judgment. Are you faithful or forgetful? when it comes to stability, the finances that God has entrusted to you? Do you have a tendency to compromise with the enemies of God? Do you allow the devil, the world, or the flesh to lodge in your sanctuary that is your heart? 
we have talked about these three areas and I hope that we take some time to ask ourselves whether we have been faithful or forgetful. The book closes with three prayers. Nehemiah prayed his short prayers in verses 22, 29 and 31. Nehemiah had done his work and would one day die. The people would one day forget about him. But God will never forget him. Why? Because he was faithful and he had not been forgetful in regards to obeying his commandments. When he prayed that prayer, Lord, remember me, God. Do you think God will remember him? Certainly. Why? Because he has been faithful to God. He has not been forgetful in obeying God's commandments. Surely God will remember him. Do you want to be remembered by God or merely by people? You know, if you want to be remembered just by people, one day people will sure forget about you. But if you are remembered by God, it is for eternity. But how can we be remembered by God? By being faithful to Him. What can we take away from today's message? Three things. Number one, it's one thing to make a promise to God, but it's something else to keep it. Let me repeat that. It's one thing to make a promise to God, but it's something else to keep it. You know, the Jews made promises regarding their families, their faith, their finances, but they broke all the promises. They broke all the promises. They were forgetful. Secondly, when it's all said and done, there's often a lot more said than done. When it's all said and done, it's, there's often a lot more said than done. In other words, the initial yes to God isn't worth much without the follow through. You know, we can promise God very easily, yes, yes Lord, I follow you, I will follow you all the days of my life. Yes Lord, I will forsake all these things and I want to, for, I want to forgive, I want to do this, I want to obey you, I want to change. We can say yes to God many times very easily. But this initial yes doesn't mean anything if it's not backed up by commitment to follow through with actions, with concrete actions. Therefore, the question is, are you faithful and committed to follow through? Are you faithful and committed to follow through with whatever you have promised to God? God has been faithful to us, but are we faithful to Him? Last but not least, Last but not least, there is a place for a Christian with righteous anger. If you notice in chapter 13 of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was angry in all three instances. I mentioned earlier that he used very strong words, especially when he saw blatant sin and evil going on. He used words like terrible wickedness, evil. He called evil, evil. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13 has this to say, to fear the Lord, is to hate evil. I pray that we will all develop a godly response towards sin and wickedness. You know, Jesus himself drove out the people from the temples when they were doing business in God's house. Jesus also had righteous anger. Of course, there's a fine line that we need to draw. We need to be very careful. You know, when we talk about righteous anger, we do not go into the kind of anger which is sinful. But at the same time, it is vital that we have the right biblical response towards sin and wickedness. And in light of this, I wish to end by saying this to all of us here. If you are watching this online service, I know these are very strong words, but I want to encourage you not to waste the many lessons that God wants to teach us through this COVID-19 pandemic. Some of us are still taking things easily or taking His grace for granted. You know, when problems come, we may turn to Him, we may seek His forgiveness, promise to change, promise to obey, but soon we forget all that we have promised Him. Friends, beware. Don't be so forgetful that you grieve the Holy Spirit. Be faithful and not forgetful. As your pastor, for members of the Oasis SIB, I'm very serious here. Just like Nehemiah, I'm warning all those of you who think that you can play, play with God. I urge you to set things right before judgment comes. Three weeks ago when I preached on this sermon entitled A Fresh Start, I mentioned this. If you don't make a fresh start, and we want to continue in our old patterns, old ways, 
old habits, judgment may come. But if we are willing to change, we can have a fresh start and we can experience a new season, a new beginning of hope, a dawn of hope that will come. Brothers and sisters, the choice is ours. And I want to encourage us to really purpose in your heart that Lord, you tell the Lord, Lord, I want to be faithful and not forgetful. I pray that you will take stock of your own life as we have already entered into the ninth year of our church. We have just recently celebrated the eighth anniversary. Now we are moving towards the ninth year. Let's all ask the Lord to help us to be faithful and not forgetful. In a short while, we're going to sing that song with all I am. One of us will just prepare ourselves. And after we sing this song, we're going to come back. I'm going to give you an altar call to just give you an opportunity to respond to the Word of God. So as we sing this song, take time to reflect on your own lives in these few areas. With regards to your family, faith and finances. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and make the right decision. Let's just bow and prepare ourselves for this closing song. Yeah.
the church right now as we come before the Lord, I want us to respond to Him by opening up your hearts. I'm going to give you this altar call right now. You may be in your homes, but I just want you to respond to the Lord. Hallelujah. It says some of us, a sense that some of us, we have broken our promises before God. We have made some promises to Him, but we have not been faithful in honouring our word. May I challenge you to recommit to following through with what you have promised to God, be it in your families, in your faith, in your finances. If that is you, you want to recommit and you are telling the Lord, Lord, help me. Help me to be faithful in following through whatever I've promised you. Just lift up your hands before the Lord right now. God has been faithful to us, and yet some of us, we take His grace, His faithfulness for granted. Let me advise you, let me also warn you, brothers and sisters, beware. It's time to get serious with Him before it's too late. And some of us here, you want to return to the Lord. You are telling the Lord, Lord, I do not want to waste any time anymore. Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to return to you. I want to return to my first love. I want to rededicate myself to you. I want to offer my life afresh to you. If that is you, I just want you to respond to the Lord as well. And last but not least, there's some of you who are in need of a healing touch from the Lord. Just lift up your hands or lay hands on that part of your body which is unwell. I believe God can heal you wherever you may be. If you put your faith in Him, and I just want to believe for a fresh anointing, fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. The healing virtue of God can flow through you. So even right now, if you're having a migraine, insomnia, hypertension, bodily aches, whatever infirmities in your body, just receive by faith. I'm going to pray a short prayer for you, for those of you who are unwell. Just appropriate the promise of God that by Jesus' stripes, you are healed. So shall we just come before the Lord and pray right now. So for the first category of people, just lift your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, You are omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient. And for those of my brothers and sisters are friends who are lifting their hands before you. Lord, you see. You see their hands that are raising to you, Lord, towards the heavens. I want to pray, Father, that, Lord, you will forgive, Lord, for their weaknesses, their struggles. But today, even as they choose the purpose in their heart to recommit themselves to you, to be faithful in following through with whatever promises, the covenants that they have made, Lord, I want to pray that your grace will rest upon them. I pray, Father, that you strengthen them, that they will be faithful in their resolve with you, O God. Lord, I just pray, Father, each time they find themselves drifting away, I pray you uphold them by your righteous right hand. Strengthen them once again, O God, that they will be faithful unto you all the way, O God. They will stand firm, with you, Lord, on your word and be faithful to the end, O God. So strengthen each one of my brothers and sisters here. And Lord, I want to thank you for those, O oh God, who have drifted away, who have grown cold, O oh God. Today, that they want to come back to their first love. Do you rekindle their first love before you? Lord, I want to thank you for those who are saying to you, Lord, Lord, I do not want to take your grace, your faithfulness for granted anymore. Forgive me, Lord. Remember me once again. Lord, I thank you that you will remember as they make this choice, this decision, oh Lord, to turn back to you. You will remember, oh God. Lord, I just pray that you help each one of them to be serious with you. The Lord, that intimacy with you, oh God. Oh, yes, Lord, we may rekindle. Lord, you reignite their passion with you right now. Holy Spirit, walk in them. Fall afresh on them, Lord. Touch them. And Lord, right now, I just want to pray for those who are in need of your healing touch. Lord, whether it's migraine, or insomnia, or hypertension, heart condition, Lord, high blood pressure, Lord, Lord, whatever bodily aches, in Jesus' name, oh God, rebuild all these symptoms, rebuild all these infirmities, 
Touch your people. Restore your people. Right now, by faith, receive the healing touch of the Lord. Receive the healing touch of the Lord. Oh, I claim a healing for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, that you will restore them and make them whole. And Lord, that you will indeed, O oh God, be glorified, O oh God. So thank you, Father. Remember us, O oh God, with your favour, just like you remembered Nehemiah. Lord, we want, O oh Lord, you to remember us. At the end of the day, it's not about people remembering us, but you, O oh God. So we pray, the Lord, you strengthen us, and we thank you for the many, many wonderful lessons you have taught us through Nehemiah's life. Help us to put them into practice, O oh God. And right now, we thank you as we dismiss and as we end this service here. We want to just ask of you, Lord, to release your blessings upon your children. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn His face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. God bless you. Dear friend, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and rose from the grave, conquering death and sin so that you can attain eternal life, then I invite you to say this simple prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for me. Thank you for sending your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I admit that I am a sinner and that I need your forgiveness. Please cleanse me from all my sins. I invite you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Saviour. Thank you for the eternal and abundant life I can experience from today onwards. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations for saying this prayer. We'd like to encourage you to get connected with us so that we can follow up on you and help you to know more about our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the family of God. Hi everyone, we want to encourage you to continue giving as it is a necessary part of our worship and a privilege to give back to God's kingdom. So brothers and sisters, please transfer your tithes and offerings to the account number shown on the screen following the instructions given. We also need your kind contributions towards our COVID-19 Benevolent Fund to help church members and others in need. You may also transfer online, but please do indicate that these funds are for the COVID-19 Benevolent Fund. On behalf of our church, the Oasis SIB, thank you and God bless you. <laughs>